1958, for the first time, cameras recorded the official opening of the British Parliament. But the event was marked by another precedent, too. For the first time in history, peeresses took seats in the House of Lords. The issue of introducing women into the House of Lords was hotly debated to the very moment of their entry. Uh, we uh, don't particularly want to have women in the House, but there's just no justification for not having them. Uh, I do feel that women in politics are fundamentally unfeminine. I feel that women do many excellent jobs of work, many which they can do far better than men. But to my mind, uh, the introduction of women into politics, into the House of Lords, uh, is unfortunate. In Victorian days, women's place was in the House but not the House of Commons or the House of Lords. 60 years ago, women didn't have a vote. Queen Victoria herself spoke up sharply about what she called the mad, wicked folly of women's rights. But beneath the serenity of turn of the century England, social and political changes were taking place. More and more schools and colleges for women were opening up in England, United States, and Canada. Some of these had high academic standards, but by and large, the young ladies were herded into boarding schools to learn to be polished, refined, cultured, and skilled in the arts. It was not considered ladylike to be too inquisitive about the world or its problems. Indeed, as late as 1912, the president of Harvard said that women were physically too fragile to stand the pace of university. After finishing school, the well-to-do were sent on the grand tour of Europe where, properly gloved and parasol, they might gaze at the art treasures of the past and feed the pigeons in a Venetian square as became ladies in a gracious, elegant world. The young woman returned, poised and confident, probably a good conversationalist, but more important, a good listener. Her sports might include the gentle game of croquet, but was more likely limited to a stroll in the park. Strenuous athletics, like rouge and lipstick and politics, were considered unladylike. The social graces prepared her for her ultimate role of wife and mother in a comfortable home, well staffed with servants. But if she didn't get married and wished to or had to earn her own living, she had only the narrowest opportunities if she was to remain respectable. She could go on the stage if she had the talent of a Sarah Bernhardt or a Jenny Lind. She could be a nurse in the romantic tradition of Florence Nightingale. She could be a telephone operator for new inventions or opening up a few new jobs for women. She could be a stenographer if she could learn typing in shorthand. She could be a school teacher, for working with children was considered natural for women. And of course, she could be a governess for the children of the wealthy. These were all respectable jobs for nice young ladies. But at the other end of the economic scale, for women who could not afford the luxury of 19th century respectability, work was no novelty. The Industrial Revolution, which was to bring about the emancipation of modern woman, at first provided her mainly more hard work, long hours, and poor pay. This was the lot of the factory girl, and there were hundreds of thousands of these girls receiving one-third or one-half the wages paid to men for similar work. And work was not confined to the factory. Among the working classes without servants, the housewife's existence was one of almost unalleviated drudgery. There were no labor-saving devices. Families were large and wash day was sweat 
day, heating water in a copper boiler, bending over washboards, wringing out clothes, and pushing a five pound hand iron as much as two miles before the family wash was finished. In the homes of the wealthy, these harsh realities existed only below stairs. Above stairs, the tea party and the fashionable at home were the social rights of the age. Help was cheap, so the lady could spend most of her life in boudoir or parlor, indulging those Victorian fancies which had been the basis of her finishing school education. Why should she worry about political rights? As Dr. Samuel Johnson had said, nature has given women so much power that the law has very wisely given them little. And yet it was from within this very group, with their servants and their stately homes, that the revolt of the women had its beginnings. Starting in 1792 with Mary Wollstonecraft's a vindication of the rights of women, and later in John Stuart Mill's The Subjection of Women, the intellectual basis for their demands had been outlined. The revolt in England began slowly and quietly with pickets and pamphlets. People who owned property, they said, should have the vote regardless of sex. Eminent women like Crystal Macmillan spoke up before the British House of Lords. Bills to enfranchise women went before the House as early as 1867, but without success. In 1897, scattered groups of non-militant suffragists united in the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. But six more years of speech-making and petitions brought them very little closer to their objectives. By 1903, a group around Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters felt that more energetic action was needed to gain their ends. They broke away from the National Union to form the Women's Social and Political Union. These militant and dedicated women, led by Christabel Pankhurst, Flora Drummond, and Mrs. Pankhurst, were out to make history. They held meetings in public squares, drawing rooms, halls, schools, and chapels at street corners and on village greens. These were missionary meetings, and they brought in thousands of new converts. Processions miles long marched through London streets. They chalked their slogans on pavements, paraded in sandwich boards, sold their newspapers in the corner, picketed the House of Commons, and flooded the streets with leaflets and handbills. Having advocated militancy, they could not hold back, but few people realized at the time to what lengths the suffragettes would go. When the Asquith government again refused the vote in 1912, England got a shock. They burned houses, poured acid into mailboxes, broke windows with hammers, threw a hatchet at the prime minister, and stormed Buckingham Palace. The reaction of the authorities was instant and vigorous, yet it served only to excite public attention. The ladies courted arrest and were obligingly carried off to jail. In one period of five days, 124 were arrested. The Pankhursts went to prison many times. In court, they refused to pay fines, preferring jail terms. I want to be tried for sedition, Mrs. Pankhurst cried, and these trips to police court and prison dominated her life. We were no longer a family, her daughter Sylvia wrote. The movement was overshadowing all personal affections. The authorities intensified efforts to subdue the unruly suffragettes and the women struck back with a new and terrible weapon, the hunger strike. When officials tried to feed them forcibly, they resisted. 
so women were released before they starved to death, then popped back into prison again when they regained their health. This cat and mouse act, as it was called, brought more protests. Outside prisons like Holloway, well-bred young was now marched proudly bearing the symbols of their jail terms. In six years, Mrs. Pankhurst and her followers succeeded in bringing the cause of British suffragettes to the attention of the world. Across the Atlantic, the movement in the United States had started in 1848, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton had drawn up a Declaration of Rights for Women. Susan B. Anthony and Mrs. Stanton led the fight for women's suffrage for the next 50 years. By 1905, Mrs. Carrie Chapman Catt and Dr. Anna Howard Shaw had taken up the national struggle. Almost as many men as women supported the cause. There was no violence, and the only arrests came from charges of obstructing. But public opinion was divided, and the fight of the suffragettes hit the front pages regularly. In Canada's Prairie Provinces, a strong movement for women's rights was led by such women as Mrs. A. V. Thomas, an outstanding feminist, and Nellie McClung, a well-known novelist and a gifted speaker. They managed to push the issue of votes right into the center of the political arena. And while the issue confused and embarrassed politicians, the general public settled back to enjoy the fracas. Early motion pictures had a field day with the suffragettes. Movies may have made light of the suffragette movement, but they were made by men. The women were in deadly earnest. In England, the fight went on with ever-increasing intensity. The suffragette, published by Christabel Pankhurst from exile in France, had long since become must-reading for young ladies. And now the stage was being set for inevitable tragedy. June 4th, 1913, the running of the Derby. Emily Wilding Davison, a militant suffragette, threw herself under the hooves of the king's horse and was killed. And the movement had a martyr.
In the funeral, thousands of women dressed in black and purple and white followed Miss Davison's casket from Victoria to King's Cross. And as always, the banners and the standards, the pamphlets and the leaflets exhorting the government to give women the vote accompanied the mourners. Mrs. Pankhurst's carriage was in the procession, but it was empty. She herself had been arrested under the Cat and Mouse Act, just as she stepped into it. With these incidents and with others like them, bombings and vandalism and arson, all by women, the suffragette movement reached a fever pitch. Yet the suffragettes, by their own militants, had driven the government to a point where it could not give in gracefully. How can you give in to lawbreakers? The situation had reached a deadlock. And then, unexpectedly, the deadlock was broken. The outbreak of war changed everything. Suddenly, the suffragettes abandoned their demands for the franchise, and women who had once harangued men for the vote now harangued them to join His Majesty's forces. Mrs. Pankhurst's followers, who'd once paraded in the cause of suffrage, now paraded in the cause of the victory loan. Mrs. Fawcett of the National Union urged, let us prove ourselves worthy of citizenship, whether our claim be recognized or not. Militants and non-militants agreed and went to join the Land Army or the Red Cross or other branches of the women's services. Jets still in jail were pardoned, and Mrs. Pankhurst and her followers toured the country making recruiting speeches. The women were as militant as ever, but the militancy was channeled into the war effort. took many young women from the sheltered comfort of their homes and private schools and put them in frontline hospitals and overseas camps in face of real dangers. Many went down in hospital ships. Others were killed in air raids. The nurses who died in the bombing of Etaples were buried under crosses marked killed in action. Perhaps the first time in history such an inscription appeared on a woman's grave. The war put England's economic and industrial system under severe strain. While production of food and material had to be increased and increased quickly, Germany submarine fleets had choked off many lines of supply. Men were needed in growing numbers for armed service. By 1918, more than four million men were under arms. This wholesale withdrawal of men could have crippled the country, but it didn't, because women stepped into the jobs they left. On farms, in factories, in the services, and at every hand, these women exploded the old myths of weakness, frailty, and irresponsibility. And they proved that they had the strength, the courage, and the discipline to do men's work. 
They were exhilarated by their indispensable role in the struggle. A new sense of freedom and equality fired them with new power. Men and politicians were astonished and impressed by all this. And from the Pacific coast to the North Sea, things began to happen on the now quiescent front of women's rights. By 1915, Finland, Norway, Iceland, and Denmark had joined New Zealand and Australia in extending the franchise to women. In the autumn of 1916 in Britain, reform of the franchise laws was begun. By now there was no doubt about women's right to the ballot. Prime Minister Asquith, previously its most powerful opponent, now supported it. And while the government was working out the terms, the women forged ahead in their new busy world. They mastered more and more industrial techniques and even learned the mysteries of the new flying machines. In 1917, the United States entered the war, and the women of America followed the example of women in England and Canada and marched off to war. Within 15 days after the declaration of war, the government appointed a committee to coordinate the women's war activities. At the head of the committee were the two most outstanding American suffragettes, Mrs. Carrie Chapman Catt and Dr. Anna Howard Shaw. Many went into the services themselves. Many more replaced men on the home front. When the Navy ran short of clerks, the secretary, Josephus Daniels, cried out, is there any law that says a yeoman must be a man? Then enroll women. And he enrolled 11,000. Sir Robert Borden, Prime Minister of Canada, said in 1917, women have shown themselves worthy to take part in the government of this country. They have thereby made abundantly clear their right to a voice in the government of the country in which they live. On September 20th, 1917, the Canadian government gave the franchise to women directly involved in the war effort. And within a year, the law was extended to include all women over 21. In January 1918, the British House of Commons gave the vote to women over the age of 30. To Mrs. Pankhurst, it was victory, though universal suffrage was still 10 years away. In the United States, the struggle continued after the war, but it was really only a matter of time. war ended in Europe, the American suffragettes resumed their own private war with the White House. But the opposition was crumbling before this determined feminine onslaught. There were some final demonstrations, a few arrests, but the politicians were climbing on the suffrage bandwagon. Victory came in 1920. Women got the vote on an equal footing with men, and there was jubilation among the suffragettes. With the vote in hand, women plunged into the upcoming political campaigns. 
In the American presidential election of 1920, women turned up at the polls by the millions. By now, women in 18 countries had the vote, and they began to enter the parliaments of the world. In 1919, Lady Astor became the first woman member of the British House of Commons. Two years later, in Canada, Agnes MacPhail was elected Member of Parliament, a post she held for 19 consecutive years. Now women began to make an international as well as domestic spheres. At the Treaty of Versailles, when the League of Nations was being organized, a delegation of women appealed for recognition. And their agitations ultimately resulted in the establishment of a special committee to study the status of women throughout the world. One of the first results of the Russian Revolution was universal suffrage. In the new Soviet Union, women were immediately given the vote and equal opportunity to hold public office. And the Russian woman became one of the symbols of the Soviet world. Elsewhere around the globe, the battle for rights continued, unrelenting and often embittered. In France, the House of Deputies several times passed bills to enfranchise women, only to meet defeat in the Senate. Then, more demonstrations and posters and pamphlets aimed at women as much as men, for frequently women themselves presented a solid wall of apathy to this new idea. and stubborn as this struggle often was, the pattern had now been set. Equal rights for women was inevitable, although in many cases, it would still take years to achieve. vote in hand, women began to wield its power. The reaction to the war had set in, and women threw their full weight behind the wave of pacifism that swept the Western world. The suffrage spirit that battled for the vote, and then for victory in the war, now joined battle with war itself. In the United States, the same women that had crusaded for equal rights had for years championed another cause, prohibition. In 1874, the many women's societies pledged to temperance had joined forces in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The passage of the 18th Amendment, prohibiting the sale of alcoholic beverages in the United States, was their victory, a victory gained even before the vote. But oddly enough, many women, as well as men, were opposed to prohibition. Mrs. Charles Sabin organized a strong force of feminine support in the cause of the wets. And then came the Roaring Twenties. Who could predict what women would do next? For they were no longer fettered by a 19th century code.
Indeed, they seem to be saying to men, anything you can do, we can do better. This was the era of the all-round sportswoman. Eleanor Sears was not only a champion walker, she fenced, rode, shot, played hockey, baseball, and football. Babe Diedrichson boxed, wrestled, competed in field games, played baseball, basketball, and golf. In 1926, Gertrude Ederle swam the English Channel, beating the record set by men. Name the contest, and the women were there five years to the day after the spirit of St. Louis landed in Paris. Amelia Earhart accomplished Lindbergh's feat flying solo across the Atlantic. She had said, women must try to do things as men have tried. By now, the finishing schools no longer satisfied the demands of the young women, and in the 20s, they flocked to women's colleges and to universities. Education, along with the vote, became the main supports of opportunity for women in the 20th century. Education gave them new interests and a new awareness of the world around them. In Canada, Mrs. Emily Murphy asked the question, are women persons under the terms of the British North America Act? If so, women were eligible for appointment to the Senate. The Supreme Court ruled women were not persons. So Mrs. Murphy appealed to the Privy Council and won. A historic event marked by a plaque outside the Senate chambers. This Privy Council decision paved the way for the appointment of the first woman to the Senate in 1930, Mrs. Kareen Wilson. With our new form of rights of citizenship have come out of responsibility. And we must familiarize ourselves with many questions which we have hitherto regarded as belonging solely to men. We must form our own opinions and not be content to rely solely upon the intuition which is usually credited to us. In 1929, the first woman was appointed to a British cabinet by Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. Here's our friend, Margaret Bunchill. Margaret Bunchill is a double first. She is the first woman who has been admitted into the Privy Council. She is now the Right Honourable Margaret Bonte. Yeah. She is also the first woman who has taken a seat in a cabinet. The United States already had its first woman governor, Ma Ferguson of Texas. And in 1932, Miss Frances Perkins became the first American woman to achieve cabinet rank as Secretary of Labor in the Roosevelt administration. But by and large, women stayed out of the rough, tough world of politics. Most of them, in fact, voted for men. But here and there, the tables were turned. And even men found themselves voting for women, women like Jenny Lee and Ellen Wilkinson in Britain. What is it that makes a country's wealth? Surely it is the number of happy homes, the number of children who have a chance in life. You cannot build a happy country, or a healthy country, or a country that is going to take its place in the world if you are going to build it on the underfed and undernourished bodies of little children. Far more significant than the numbers of women elected were the changes they brought about in laws and political platforms. Women voters were primarily concerned with living conditions. And to appeal to them, politicians had to offer legislation in the fields of health and social welfare. During the 30s, drastic changes came about in labor legislation, which were to change the lot of the working girl. Just as old-fashioned production methods gave way to the assembly line, so the old-fashioned factory conditions were replaced by new codes and standards affecting hours of work, safety, sanitation, and minimum wages. In the United States, the government set up the Federal Women's Bureau, 
to formulate standards and policies which shall promote the welfare of wage earning women, improve their working conditions, increase their efficiency, and advance their opportunities for profitable employment. The factory girl was also protected by an inspection system which was often planned and administered by women themselves. By the end of the 30s, 12 million women were holding jobs in the United States. And on both sides of the Atlantic, regulations were going into effect, establishing new standards of industrial safety and cleanliness, conditions of temperature, humidity, and ventilation, and prescribing such items as restrooms, drinking water, and fire escapes. The working girl was now predominantly a factory or office girl. The domestic servant was disappearing rapidly. Management, too, began to do things to make jobs more attractive to women. The help wanted ads of newspapers were offering an ever-expanding variety of opportunities for women. And to make sure it was getting the right girl for the right job, management evolved the personnel officer, usually a woman, where the majority of employees were women. And so women took their places in industry and in the labor unions as well. Once firmly opposed to the employment of women, most unions now accepted the inevitable and welcomed them as full members. In 1900, there were 200,000 women clerical workers in the United States. 30 years later, there were two million. The office had become the private empire of that 20th century phenomenon the white collar girl. Whether filing clerk or stenographer, bookkeeper or private secretary, she dominated by her very numbers every sizable office on two continents. By and large, she tended to be a transient, to quit her job and get married and raise children. But without her, the business world would have ground to a stop. Out of the ranks of the white collar girl emerged the career woman. Women who seized the new opportunities and became able supervisors and administrators. As their horizon expanded with each newly discovered talent, women reached further and further afield, tackled and mastered almost every job. By the end of the 30s, out of 451 occupations listed by the American Census Bureau, only three had no women. They were there at almost every hand, carving out successful careers even in such exclusive male strongholds as journalism and the diplomatic service. The United States has had women ambassadors since 1933. The legal profession was closed to women before 1919, but by the 30s, women lawyers had become commonplace. One year, a Canadian woman surprised the world's farmers by winning the wheat crown with her reward wheat at the Chicago International Grain Exposition. Advances in science and technology were creating new jobs and new careers. Women were taking their share of these new opportunities. Pathology, microbiology, and laboratory work of all kinds were attracting many women. Nursing had been a traditional occupation for women, not only were there now women dentists and doctors and surgeons, but there were women in almost every branch of medical practice and research. In Victorian times, young ladies practiced the art of line and proportion. Now some of them were designing dams and power stations. There were women in the highly specialized fields of aeronautical engineering and aerodynamics, in meteorology, in astronomy. By 1939, women had penetrated almost every field of human endeavor in the Western world. Then came World War II, a war far different from the first one. In this conflict, the frontline dangers were no longer confined to actual battle zones. In a Britain attacked from the air and in danger of invasion, women not only replaced men in the more conventional jobs, but also took charge of balloon barrage sites, staffed radar installations, tracked enemy aircraft, and manned anti-aircraft guns. Thousands served as air raid wardens and firefighters, rescue workers, and ambulance drivers under the direction of the Honorable Ellen Wilkinson, now Minister of Home Security. The same battle for survival was fought by the women of Russia. 
The front line was anywhere and everywhere, and they were in it to the end. In Britain, pilots like Amy Johnston and Pauline Gower joined the women's section of the Air Transport Auxiliary and delivered planes from factory to aerodrome. A number of women were dropped by parachute behind enemy lines to help the resistance movements. In some countries, like Yugoslavia, torn by political strife and invaded by the Nazis, there was little room for the non-combatant. Many men and women took to the mountains to continue the struggle in smaller groups. In the guerrilla tactics of surprise and ambush, women as well as men struck the enemy wherever they could, giving and getting no quarter. There were other jobs away from the immediate lines of battle, but all important to the war. Rosie the Riveter built ships. She may not have been at the job as long as some of the men, but she learned fast. In Canada, at the end of the war, over one million women were working. In Britain, in the munitions industry alone, almost two million women worked side by side with men. Even before the United States entered the war, 12 and one half million women there had jobs. This number rose quickly as women swarmed into the aircraft plants, shipyards, and the hundreds of other essential industries. As at the end of the First World War, the years 1945 to 49 saw a new wave of victories for female suffrage. In these few years, 23 countries extended the franchise to women and a whole new generation of politicians had arrived. In the United States, Margaret Chase Smith was the first full-time lady senator. The 80th Congress included five women representatives. This was not the increase in numbers that had once been expected, but those that did enter politics were in it for all they were worth. In the United Kingdom, Dr. Edith Summerskill became the fourth woman cabinet minister, and in the election of 1945, 24 women were elected, including Mrs. Bessie Braddock, the fiery member from Liverpool. In Canada, Madame Therese Casgrain, here chatting with Senator Karine Wilson, was the first woman in the province of Quebec to run for federal office. Following a long family tradition, Mrs. Jean Castleman was sworn into office, joining her father in the House of Commons and taking the seat of her late husband. In the years after Canadian women got the vote, they won seats in five provincial legislatures. And in 1949, Mrs. Nancy Hodges was elected Speaker of the British Columbia Legislature, the first woman to hold that office in the British Commonwealth. Today, Canada has its first woman in the federal cabinet, Mrs. Ellen Fairclough, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, and on occasion, acting prime minister, culminating a process of change in the status of women, which in Canada began almost 100 years ago. Well, that was most interesting. What I have just seen has brought to my mind some things that I had forgotten. I dare say you had too. It's difficult to realize that only half a century ago, a woman was not even a person, officially, in Canada, and that it took quite a long struggle by some very determined women to change this. Yet Canada never experienced that bitter opposition to granting the vote to women or the recognition of their rights, which prevailed in other countries. There were no violent demonstrations and no hunger strikes here. The main reason, perhaps, is that Canada is still pretty much a pioneer country. When the West was settled around the turn of the century, the women pioneers worked side by side with their men as they had done in Eastern Canada. And the men learned to respect them as equals. It is not altogether an accident that Manitoba was the first Canadian province to grant the franchise to women. One of the first in the world, in fact. And Alberta and Saskatchewan, the next two. The other provinces followed the lead of the West. Well, this may not be quite fair to Ontario, since there was always a strong suffrage movement in that province. Emily Stowe, who was the first woman doctor in Canada, 
was so annoyed by the fact that she could not obtain a medical degree merely because she was a woman that she launched a movement to gain equality for women. It is poetic justice, in a sense, to recall that her daughter became the first woman admitted to a Canadian medical school. When Dr. Stowe died, her daughter in turn became the leader of the suffrage movement in Ontario. These women had their counterparts in every province, in the Maritimes, in British Columbia, and certainly in Quebec, where women demanded the vote as early as 1913, but only won their struggle in 1940 under the leadership of Madame Therese Casgrain. Since 1921, when Agnes MacPhail became the first woman MP, 10 women have been elected to the House of Commons. And since the appointment in 1930 of Karine Wilson, the first woman senator, six women have sat in the Senate. In municipal politics, women have become increasingly successful. I read recently where there are now about 1,200 women holding elected offices at the municipal level across Canada. But it is true that at the moment, there are only three of us in the House of Commons, Margaret Aitken, Jean Castleman, and myself. Some might say that it was hardly worthwhile that we should have obtained the vote after all. But I don't think that the early suffragettes ever intended to storm the House of Commons with hordes of women MPs. Their idea was, primarily, to influence Parliament by the vote of women. As a parliamentarian, I can tell you that they have succeeded. Today, every good politician knows the strength of the women's vote. I believe their influence has been an important factor in the development of our present program of social security. As more and more women are gaining the right to vote in many countries, they are able to share with men an increasing measure of responsibility in all phases of national life. And their voice is heard more and more in world councils. Many of them have found at the United Nations an ideal atmosphere in which to work for a better world. From the earliest days of the UN, women have proved particularly effective in those agencies concerned with refugees and children and the health and education of underprivileged people everywhere. Outstanding among these women was Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, the indefatigable and relentless champion of human rights. Chairman during the crucial years of the commission which defined those rights in a universal declaration, Mrs. Roosevelt was also United States representative to the Fourth General Assembly. Israel's foreign minister, Mrs. Golda Meyer, has addressed the assembly. For its eighth session, the Assembly elected as President, Madam Pandit of India, one of the world's most experienced diplomats. Mrs. Alva Myrtle of the UN Secretariat said recently, Women will feel particularly encouraged to know that United Nations has devoted one whole commission to study how the present disadvantages that women have in most countries, or I might say in all countries, may be overcome a commission on the status of women meeting last in Beirut, Lebanon, with a French lady, Madame Le Forcheux, as chairman, and an Indian lady, Mrs. Menem, as chief of the corresponding section in the Secretariat. Is that not a new page in the history of women's movement? The UN Commission on the Status of Women proclaimed as its first aim equal participation of women in government and the possibility for women to exercise all the rights and assume all the duties as citizens. The Commission's very first priority was the extension of political rights. But the British delegate underlined a very important point. The work of this Commission has stimulated a number of governments in the past few years to give women full political equality. Once equal political rights have been written into laws and constitutions, this commission uh, can't do very much to help the women in their own countries. It's over then to the women's organizations by their work to see that these political rights are fully used. The many women's organizations in the countries where women have won their political rights have long been concerned with the full use of these rights. The Imperial Order of the Daughters of the Empire one of Canada's largest women's organizations is dedicated to the promotion of good citizenship and patriotism. 
It provides bursaries and scholarships to students and engages in many other philanthropic activities. Although non-political, it doesn't hesitate to take a stand on any policy which it feels is contrary to the national interest. In the United States, one of the most vocal and influential among women's groups is the Daughters of the American Revolution. The resolutions passed at their annual conventions, held at their headquarters within sight of the White House, take a firm stand on most national issues. In some cases, women as a distinct political force have challenged a government on a national issue. In South Africa, women formed the Black Sash Movement to protest what they claimed were unconstitutional methods being used by the government to maintain its policy of racial segregation. The six million members of Associated Country Women of the World in 27 different countries are concerned with every feature of rural life from farm prices to cooking methods from illiteracy to health services. The Danish delegate to the UN Commission raised a problem women still face in most countries. Should I mention one problem for us? It is the problem of equal pay for equal work. Here we still have some way to go. How far this way will be depends first on the work we do on the national level, next on the work done here in this commission. The principle equal pay for equal work is only one part of a political problem and so far also dependent on how women carry out their political rights. In spite of recommendations, resolutions, and even legislation, the gap between men's and women's wages for the same output on the same job has not been entirely eliminated, even in the most politically advanced countries. The delegate from Greece emphasized the need for women's organizations in every country to carry on an extensive and continuing campaign of political education among women, even after they've gained the franchise. Education is the key to the improvement in the status of women. For centuries, in much of the world, literacy has been the prized possession of a privileged few. And of these few, fewer still were women. Today, a war is being waged on illiteracy. Girls as well as boys, women as well as men, are learning their letters with an enthusiasm almost unknown in the West. Behind all this emphasis on learning lies the hope that these women will take an increasing interest in the political affairs of their countries. For only by means of an informed and questioning electorate can these countries hope to advance as democracies. Madam Chairman, I agree with you that the question of political rights for women will continue to feature as an important item in the agenda of the Commission as long as women in any single part of the world are victims of social injustice and legal inequality. For political rights form the foundation on which the superstructure of all other rights must necessarily be built. Illiteracy did not mean the denial of political rights in some of the new nations of Asia, such as India. In India's first national election in 1951, the electorate was 80% illiterate. Those who could not read the campaign literature listened to the speeches of the candidates as they traveled through the cities and the villages. Each party had a symbol, and more than 100 million men and women voted, either marking ballots or picking the party symbol.
So in these new countries, Asia and Africa, women are going to the polls whether they can read and write or not. The methods of voting may vary, but the important fact is that for the first time, women have a part in choosing their governments. In the West, election day is an old story to men, but to women, it is still relatively new, for it's only within the last generation that they've achieved political rights. And in these intervening years, the status of women throughout the world has begun to change too. There are many people who deplore this, claiming that the fundamental role of women in society, raising children, is jeopardized by their social and political emancipation. But others see no irreconcilable conflict between women's responsibilities to the family and the full exercise of the duties and privileges of first-class citizenship. This debate will go on for a long time yet. Women are still on the march, still seeking full partnership with men. And the march has not yet ended. <laughs>